Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled to be welcoming back the wonderful Jake Lacey to talk all about his latest series on Peacock, A Friend of the Family. And I wanted to start by talking about the initial conversations that you had with Nick Antoska, who's um, the creator of the series, because he was very clear with you from the beginning. It sounds like, like this isn't anything where we want to be gratuitous in any way. It's very much about tapping into the idea of and exploring the psychological element of, of what this was and what this sort of specific grooming looks like with someone that ingratiated themselves into this entire family. Um, and with him giving you that viewpoint at the beginning, I was really interested in how that gave you such a clear idea of how to approach a character like this, because there's so much complexity with telling a story like this and so much delicacy as well. So how did that really help you in, in opening up and figuring out how to approach this character? Uh, well, you're right, uh, Nick, early on, like I think maybe the first discussion that we had um, in regard to the project really made two things very clear. The first was uh, that Jan Broberg and, and Marianne were producers on this and creatively involved. And when he had approached them, uh, he'd been clear to them to say, I'd like to tell your story. I think there's more here um, to share or, or from another perspective, uh, but I only want it if you're involved. Um, if, you, if you're not interested, then I'll, I'll back away. I, I don't want to do this without you. Um, Cause I think he understands that it's very easy given the extreme nature of the story, like the, the craziness of the facts of this story, that it lends itself to being voyeuristic if you don't have that voice from the inside saying this is what it felt like to be in the situation this is what it looked like this is how it uh appeared to us at the time you know it's like very easy to sit in judgment from the outside looking in and then the other piece was saying uh you know we're not we're not trying to hire someone who's 18 or 19 to play 14 so that we can then legally, you know, film scenes of abuse. Uh, Nick was pretty clear to say, like, you know, I, as a human, I have no interest in creating that. Um, you know, as a producer, I don't, I don't want to make it or put people through that, having to film that. And and then also just narratively, you know, so much of what the Brobergs experience is knowing that something's wrong and not knowing what it is um having this feeling of of uh fear and despair and concern and um but not being able to to really put their finger on it and so that plays into how he wanted to to create the series and lay it out that as an audience you also are are unaware on the specifics as to what's going on and are very aware that something terrible is happening um, so in terms of how that opened up the character, I, I think, um, I think it was mostly that I, as a, as a human, as an actor could like put those concerns aside and then really just address the work in front of me, you know, not kind of also have that concern running of, of like, when are we filming those abuse scenes and how's that going to work? And is this younger actor going to be okay while we're doing this and you know how how will the crew respond to this moment and how will you know just just a genuine worry for another person um trying to film that stuff and jan herself also um kind of wrote you a letter right when production started telling you some of the details about, you know, his personality and, and kind of calling out he was a very charming person and he was a wonderful storyteller because obviously there's there's an offensive to the charm as to how he was able to ingratiate himself to this entire family in the way that he did. Um, you know, and, and I've heard you say that he kind of saw himself as probably a, a Steve McQueen kind of running away with the love of his life. And, and so how did you go into it with that viewpoint of even though the story is being told from Jan's perspective, that at the end of the day, he's the main character in his own story and his own narrative throughout. You know, a thing that in in hindsight really helped that was with the exception of really episode one and then episode three, which, you know, takes us back to the, the time between the Birch Tolls and Broberg's meeting. And then that first abduction and sort of you know, layers in 
well, this is how you go from a close acquaintance to a close friend to, you know, a near family member to where's our daughter. Um, with the exception of those episodes, I was filming essentially only with uh, either Hendrix or McKenna. And so, you know, when cut together, you see the effect that my actions are having on the Broberg family. But for the most part, I was acting only in these scenes in which like I'm the hero or there's room for me to really kind of ease into that, to lay back into like, I'm Danny Ocean and this is a heist, you know, that I'm Steve McQueen and, uh, you know, I'm a rebel and people don't get it and I'm charming and, you know, all these things that he saw um, as his personality or, or his charisma or whatever, you know, however he imagined himself in the world. And so it wasn't until I saw, you know, episode one, where the, the back half of that episode is uh, Gail and the Brobergs kind of silently negotiating how to move forward with contacting the authorities and, um, and actually seeing like the pain and distress that, that this is causing. So that's a very long <laughs> way to say that like um, I wasn't confronted ever, even as an actor with seeing the fallout. You know, like I got to live in this kind of silo blinders on of like, I'm getting away with it. I just get to think about me. I get to think about the fun center and how things are going with Jan and how I'm going to, you know, take her away this time and keep Marianne over here and keep Bob there. And, you know, like got to live just in his world, um, which protected me, I think, from, you know, as a character and an actor as having to reconcile like what am i doing to these people because he didn't care <laughs> do you know what i mean like uh so as an actor not having to be privy to that i also didn't have to care in a way and with those scenes that you did get to play where we get to see him alongside the entire family you know, it's it's not someone coming in and saying, you know, I'm taking your daughter with me and we're going to get married and we're going to run away together. It's these tiny, tiny, intricate paper cuts. And so there's a lot of nuance in how you have to approach it because he's kind of slowly, gradually breaking them down and building their trust. In, and there's a different type of charm offensive that he's using with each member of the family as well. And so what were some of the delicacies which came with really focusing on the, the minutia of his actions, the minutia of the way that he said certain things to them or would compliment them? You know, there's two scenes that come to mind. One is um, it's sort of within and a montage and then it sort of breaks out of that, but it's early on and the kids are sitting on Bob Broberg's lap and he's sort of pretending, I think not to be Santa, but just sort of like doing this simply like pony ride on his knee kind of thing. And um, I'm in the doorway seemingly, you know, enjoying the scene, but mostly honed in on Jan. And then from there, turn and go into the kitchen where Marianne is, um, I think, you know, cutting a cake to like bring out to people and sort of work that angle that I brought my copy of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which she had recommended. And I knew that Bob wasn't going to read it. And so I read it as a way to be like, I see you, you know, um, I get it. I, I get that you're looking for something more and, you know, complimenting her and then offering to take the kids to school and just finding that was like, the delicate balance when everyone's together and finding a way to, you know, it starts with Nick's wonderful writing, um, but to find a way to, you know, put your thumb on the scale one direction or another without like tipping your hand. The other really high stakes one is um, I've been to my lawyer's office Marianne's met me there and I tell her to, you know, come to this like country dirt road basically and bring Jan so I can explain to her why I'm going to take this plea. And I'm both like uh, getting Jan's commitment as a partner 
and convincing Marianne that this is all because she and I are in love and they're both sat in the front seat and I'm in the back, like truly playing both sides. Um, uh, you know, a lot of that's in the writing, a lot of that's in the directing. And then also, <laughs> like, I think Stephen Pyatt was directing that episode and he just was like, he's like, give me a little moment you know, I think I say like, could you ever love a jailbird, Dolly? And she says, yes. And and I smile at her and then like look to Mary and kind of give this eye roll like, oh, kids, you know, like he's so aware. And they have this wonderful shot of Anna going like, you know, then she clocks like, what the hell is going on? Um, but those are the really like, in reading it, you think like, how are we going to do this? That it, that it, reads as true, as honest, and also it reads as, as Birch told being a master manipulator and not the Brobergs being dim, you know, because they were naive and they were trusting, um, but they weren't stupid people, you know? So how, how do you like um, give them their due and not be like, oh, these rubes fell for it, but to show that he really, um, was an expert at, at playing people. Yeah. And with what you're describing there about, you know, the, the tiny, tiny, tiny looks and the way that that can really change the element of a scene, you know, and even moments where he's with Bob and Marianne comes by. And even if, you know, he's not quite catching her eye, there's a way that he's looking at her, as she's going by or the way that he sees Jan when she walks into a room. And there's all these little intricate looks that he's giving the family in different ways at different spaces. Um, and I've heard you mention that this was this was very collaborative, you know, not only in terms of, of Nick and the show's directors, but also cinematography wise with the camera team. Um, and so was there a different level of, of that style of collaboration that you had with them all in really just figuring out and having to know specifically what the framing was so that you could know where to bring those moments in you know it yeah it was it was a mix of um just those these little like happy discoveries you know along the way where you hope that you're all on the same page enough to to kind of take the framework of this scene and and the story and flesh it out lock it out in a certain way that feels um honest to everybody involved and then um some choices as how best to shoot that and then you know there's a handful of like the episode from last week at episode eight you know things are quickly falling apart for B and um before I'm taken into custody by the FBI I'm in my motor home and reaching for like cash that I've stashed like in the wall of the bathroom, you know, and just in that setup, um, wonderful camera operator, Alvaro, you know, the door swings open and there's this mirror and I reach, you know, back and he was like, Oh, dude, just push the door a little more and we can get the reflection of like you and the mirror as you reach, you know, and, finding those things to visually express like the duplicity, the multifaceted elements to his personhood and personality and like who is the real Birch told and does he even know? And, um, you know, just things like that, you know, or, or um, again, that shot, the reality is that like there's a medicine cabinet and it's just the money sitting in the medicine cabinet. So some of that is also, the fun geometry of going like, dude, if I hold the door here and really lean, but my arm just goes to here, does it look like I'm reaching inside of the wall? Cause really it's just at my shoulder, you know, and being like, yeah, if you lift the arm more, you it looks like you're inside. Like all of that, like just how to sell a story better and better and better. And that relationship, you know, we were fortunate to be working together for seven months. So a month in, you start to build this thing, you know, or this relationship, this great thing where I trust what they're seeing when they're saying like, 
I think I think go for go lean a little further over and we get this nice play with the light, you know, okay. Or me seeing something and saying like, if I do this, does it read as that? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, we can come around on this. You know, like that kind of trust to hear each other and then build something together is, I love it. <laughs> I have like, it's my favorite part of, of the actual work experience is like cinematographer, director, writer, like any of that collaborative stuff where you, you know, the same with Nick to say like, why is this moment like this? What is that? You know, can it be that? And either saying, yeah, that's way better. Or him going, it has to be this because that's what happened. You know, like that's, I know it seems a little on the nose. It's literally what happened. Okay, <laughs> let's do it, man. <laughs> you know, like I, I mentioned, sorry to just ramble on. I just love the project, but like I mentioned to the nuns at the school where I stashed Jan, you know, Jerry, sorry, President Ford. And I was like, I get he's trying to legitimize his kind of cover story of being the CIA, but it's a little outlandish that he's claiming to be close friends with Gerald Ford. And Nick was like, that's what he did. Dan has said that he told people he was close to Gerald Ford. <laughs> you know, like, so you go like, okay, that's insane. Okay, let's do it. You know, like, he's like, it seems nuts. It's nuts. That's what he did. Amazing. And, and with what you were saying just there as well about, you know, the interpretation of his intentions, you know, in playing a role like this, that must be one of the really fascinating things to determine, you know, how aware is he of his actions. And so in playing him, did you want to go into this with the idea that he's very aware and very calculated in terms of what he's doing and how he's doing it? Or did you see it more as because there's such a degree of narcissism and that level is so high that, you know, he's kind of blinded to himself and it's just this is the way he moves in the world? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I think it really is a mix. There's at least the the story that we've told and 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 you know Birch told died long before we started this and understandably his family was not particularly interested in uh <laughs> speaking to any of us about um his life and so you know I'm fulfilling this character that we've built and have uh you know facts to support but within the storytelling element the narrative element i think i found that there were times where he truly believes he's in love with jan and that they're meant to be together and there's times where she's exclusively a perverse sexual object for him to have and he'll go to any lengths to have her alone. Um, and I don't know if he knew which of those was happening at which points. Um, so there's also, you know, there's a, I say fun because as an actor, it's fulfilling, it's horrific subject matter, um, but creatively really fulfilling to, to try to walk that line in a performance um you know where i'm committing fully to things that are are either a manipulation or are really how he feels um or somewhere in the middle um and then at times you see it all drop away which is also um, fun, you know, for lack of a better term, to just build something like that is really fulfilling. It's, I think, uh, sort of hopefully grotesque to, to witness, to watch, but the making of that is really fulfilling. There's like the scene where Gail is kind of trying to walk down memory lane and say like, you know, I remember when we first started seeing each other and we went to those caves and said all those fresh things and they echoed and, you know, and <laughs> to try and make these calls as Frank Tobler to find a place to stash a 14 year old girl in another state, you know, from his ex-wife's kitchen. 
And uh, I mean, Leo is just so wonderful to to work with and and build something with. And um, it's heartbreaking to see Gail fighting for this thing that is horrifically toxic in her life. And um, and then this line is just like, we'll always be pals. <laughs> like the most devoid of compassion, the most just like in service of being like, how quickly can I get out this door? And you see this like, this is a woman he's built a life with. He certainly has also, you know, she's 17 when they get married and he's manipulated her from the age of 12 eight to like um be in love with him but they also have like kids together and he just has a void where a soul should be you know and when the veneer comes down it's it's fascinating to watch the way that he operates when things are closing in on him and the way that the veneer comes down in different ways so you said sometimes it's just this complete disconnect he's completely focused on something and it almost feels like the more things are closing in on him, the more he doubles down and the faster he's trying to move everything around him, you know, but those are also the moments where the anger comes to the surface for him as well. And so how did you find the different ways in which you wanted him to operate and what you wanted it to look like when it's not the presentation of I'm Steve McQueen on the run, but it's the FBI are here right now. You know, we shot the scene inside the motorhome when the FBI arrive and are you know on the bullhorn saying like robert birch told we're not in judgment of your innocence or guilt but like come out with your hands up um we shot that you know five or six times the interior of that a mix of you know because we just have no idea what he actually went through in that moment and so um given that he's such a wild card uh Jamie, who is directing that, and and myself kind of worked out like, here's four or five paths that I think are honest to this moment. And let's do them all. And in the edit, you know, you sort out what plays best in terms of like the arc that you're building. Um, because so much of this is, is trying to construct and edit in some way an honest performance on set, knowing that then many people will sit in an edit bay for hours and select this take over that take and this thing and move that scene out. And, you know, and so what you think you've built organically then becomes a different thing. Um, so there's a version where he considers going out like guns blazing. And there's a version we shot where I put the gun in my mouth and think about like, do I end it here? Uh, and I, the one they selected is just sitting and staring, which I think is absolutely right. You know, a man who loathes being trapped, who lo who is like constantly fighting to expand his place in the world and his influence over people and things around him to then have no outs is just as if he could like disappear, you know? Um, and then some of that is also, it's tough. It's like, there is also a version of this whole, you know, all nine episodes that we didn't shoot. You know, it's not the version that we like wrote or made, but in watching it, I think like, oh, there's a version where the veneer never cracks where he remains seemingly that friend of the family seemingly the like this is all misunderstanding <laughs> kind of attitude and it's it would be probably really unfulfilling to watch in a way because it would be so infuriating to see him never never give you an inch of anger or engagement or guilt or shame or you know 
to just remain, well, that's the way it is, you know, through all of this. Um, anyway, yes, it was, it's a lot of like picking and choosing. And then at times, you know, working out a couple options to then let Nick and, and Jamie and the director for whichever episode go like, oh, that's, this is the thing here. Also going back to what you were saying before about in telling the story and and really adhering to the truth of what happened, there's a lot of aspects of this that feel very heightened and, and you know, if it wasn't for the fact that it was true, would never be written into the narrative in that way. Even just the yes. fact that the way that he brainwashes her is playing these tapes and making her believe that there's communication from life form on another planet. And that is, you know, the absolute wholehearted truth to Jen from the way that he presents it and the way that he kind of gaslights her. And so were there challenges that came with telling a story, really adhering to the truth and being very honest to, to Jan's experience, but also finding how that works in a narrative form? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think it only made it easier, you know, um, the person I'm portraying is not JFK. It's not someone that is held on a pedestal by millions of people for generations. And you think like, I really want to get this perfectly right for this individual, for their legacy, you know? And I think that gave me some leeway because the person that I, I want to get it right for is Jan, you know? Um, and knowing that this is true and, and that we have diary entries and letters that they wrote to one another and uh, court documents and, you know, it, just a wealth of evidence and information to build this story out of made it really easy to, like I was saying with the, you know, President Ford stuff to just give over to saying like, this is what happened. This is how it went. Like commit to the thing we wrote here. Because sometimes when you do a project and you think like, oh, I don't know, I can feel the story beats trying to work to get the narrative to go in this direction. And you have to do some kind of gymnastics to go like, okay, let's find a way that this feels organic, you know, whereas in this case, sort of two major pieces, one being it's true. And Nick and Jan have been clear to say, like, there are things that were omitted. And some of the timeline things are compressed for the sake of a story. But there's nothing added here. It's not like, oh, we added the second abduction oh, we added that it was California and not Iowa. You know, like, no, <laughs> this is this is the facts, you know? Um, and then the other piece being that there's, you know, there's a scene Rachel was uh, directing and I'm, I'm trying to convince Marianne to stay. I'm seducing her. I'm threatening her. I'm guilting her. I'm shaming Bob. I'm seven different tactics in about two and a half minutes. And, and we shot the scene and I was like this, they were like, that's great. How's it feel? And I was like, it feels really weird. It does not feel good. It doesn't feel like we're doing well with this scene, you know, like that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but it just, it's not always indicative of the scene being good or not. And, and Nick was like, you know, I think you're expecting it to be organic, but this is a person without compassion and humanity in the way that you or I have it. And so he is shamelessly going from, I love you so much. Why can't you love me back to get out of my life? I never want to see you again. You know, like there is no organic thread. You just have to commit fully to each of these things. Um, and then <laughs> observe and wait for the next to figure out where you can get the best blow in. Um, so I felt like th those circumstances just created like a kind of free space to create and build something. It didn't feel hemmed in to be like, we have to get this right. It just was feeling like this is right. Let's do it. 
I mean, I, with with all the intricacies that came with this role, I think it's such an incredible performance. So I want to congratulate you on everything with the show and with your performance in Thank it. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.